Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that, um, first of all, I'm going to be talking a lot about sex and bodies and women. And this research began when I was organizing an exhibition titled Art Post Internet. And basically, I was going throughout this research and organized this show last year. And um, I found a dearth of artists working directly with gender and sexuality. So basically, this is the runoff of that. And, um, and so we'll basically go through a text that I wrote for Mass Effect, which is an anthology edited by Lauren Cornell and Ed Halter. And um, I'm also kind of ending with a lot of questions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I'll end with whoa. I'll end with some questions. So basically, the the last part of this talk is actually very, very kind of information, and yeah. Um, the talk is also driven and organized by the work of artists. So I'm t talking mostly about um, the work of artists and a reading of Laura Mulvey. Um, one of the most dramatic developments in the nature of social interaction since the advent of the internet is the emancipation of our identities and sexual lives from the body and meat space interaction. We are no longer bound to our own bodies and the social encryptions that they carry while we socialize, and we no longer must seek out sexual or romantic partners in physical spaces dedicated to such. We can see the effects of this emancipation from our physical nature, perhaps most clearly, in hookup culture. While geographic cruising zones still exist, including um, bars, parks, and everything, and this, was, um, this is a photo of the West Chelsea Piers in New York from the 1970s, which is a really important site for um, creative culture and also a, a really a famous gay meeting point. Um, but while these zones still exist, they're no longer the only way in which we find partners. These sites have been streamlined by um, searchable terms online, such as uncut, drug and disease free, 420 friendly, and so on. While Craigslist and later smartphone applications such as Tinder and Grindr are but three obvious meeting points for no strings attached sex, other web platforms such as Tumblr and YouTube have become host to lesser known communities of sexual fetishists. These fetishes, oftentimes extremely strange to the heteronormative orthodox and sometimes quite niche, are amplified by the privacy of and supported by the blank slate of the internet. Fetishes range from just about anything to just about anything, furries, wet clothes, celebrity feet, so on and so forth. The tendency to make fetishistic porn out of everything is so pervasive online that the notorious 4chan random message board, B, wrote in their rules of the internet that, for example, num number 34, if it exists, there's porn out of it, no exceptions. And number 35, if no porn is found of it, it will be created. And number 36, no matter what it is, it's someone's fetish, no exceptions. The videos of Glasgow-based Charlotte Proger track this march from the geographic cruising zone to the online fetish community. She rips footage from a YouTube account that records ritualistic acts imposed upon Nike collectible sneakers. Now you can see this here, um, installed on a cube monitor. Proger's videos are overlaid with audio recitations of comments received by the YouTube, by the YouTube user who goes by the very apropos name Nike Classics, as well as queer diaristic passages chosen by the artists. In one video, we see only the torso and legs of a young man as he dissects collectible sneakers, cutting them in half and ripping off layers of leather. In another video, two young men in track pants exchange their sneakers back and forth. As the men continue to occupy each other's respective negative spaces with their feet, the actions become an analog for sex. It is apparent that the viewing, in addition to the production of such videos, is sexually enticing for some, 
and even con constitutes the supportive community of video producers. This is evidenced by a comment left on Nike Classics video by the YouTube user Wet Rev, apparently a wet clothes fetishist. Should both play in the mud or water in those Nikes and trackies too, squash each other's Nikes into the water. Uh, Prider also uses the deconstruction of the shoe as kind of a metaphor for um, the deconstruction of film as well. And you'll notice that I'm talking about artists who aren't necessarily associated with post-internet. Um, that was a very conscious de decision to kind of build an art historical lineage that doesn't necessarily um, begin and end with the artists that were included in this exhibition that I just curated. So Laurie Simmons, for example, is much older than, say, Bunny Rogers, who I'll talk about later in the talk. The artist Laurie Simmons is largely know, known for her photographs of dolls and the cultural assumptions about femininity and domesticity that we project upon them. She has recently produced work tracking the advent of the dollar cosplay subculture. Here's where things get a little hairy if you're unfamiliar with the rabbit hole of cosplay, itself a portmanteau of costume play. The Japanese term kigurumi describes a person dressed in a full body costume of a cartoon character or animal. Dollars were latex kigurumi masks emulating female anime characters. To be a proper dollar, you must wear a kigurumi doll mask with a full body latex suit in order to adequately mirror the matte quality of a cartoon character's skin. Simmons purchased several kigurumi masks intricately painted by an, article, by an artist in Russia and cast models to wear, th to, oh, sorry, to wear them, latex suit and all, in variably sexualized poses. One photo captures a dollar wearing heels, pink thigh high socks, and a mini skirt while tugging down a pink shirt and gazing into the camera. Another depicts a blonde dollar holding in a bathtub a skeptical looking dog, while another shows a darker skinned gigarumi taking a selfie. Given our growing predilection for finding sex and love online, and the increasingly niche forms of sexuality, that have been taken since fetishes have become indexable and searchable, Simmons's interest in such online subculture seems a prescient front. Those at odds with the culturally determined ideas about normativity once sought to allevi alleviate their frustrations in physical spaces, the cruising park. Simmons's photograph Simmons's photographs re reiterate the weirdly beautiful agency in such subcultures and the tragedy of the repressive cultural conditions that precipitate them. Performance artist Anna Hirsch looks not to fetish subcultures, but to the early days of the web, circa 1998, where conversing with strangers was the rule, not the exception. Her piece, Playground, um, from 2013, is a play with two characters. Annie, who is mostly autobiographical and based on a plucky 12-year-old Hirsch, and Job, a 27-year-old hacker who has a penchant for chatting up preteens online. The play begins with Annie and Job sitting at their respective chipboard worktop workstations, enraptured by the chat playing out on their respective junky monitors, a nostalgic mise-en-scene for anyone born pre-Y2K. Their conversation, projected behind them for the audience to read, revolves around their chosen chat room politics and quickly takes on a creepy tone, with Jove asking Annie to be his online girlfriend. This title comes with the probing sexual questions in a masturbation coaching session through the telephone, with Annie lying and hilariously faking orgasm. And then, um, so you can see this chat play out on the screen. Job says, did you come, Annie? Annie says, yes, did you? Job says, yes, I came for you. Annie says, me too. Job says, you did so good, Annie. I'm proud of you. Annie says, me too. I'm proud of me too. Job says, are you being facetious with me? Annie says, no. Well, I don't know what's facetious. 
Annie and Job waver between breaking up and getting back together. Annie begins to doubt Job after he asks her to pick a, stick a pen up her vagina and send it to him in the mail. His next desperate last ditch request for soiled underwear prompted Hirsch to formally dump Job. After a brief break, they got back together, hugging and declaring their eternal love for each other as the play ends. While Hirsch's play represents an obvious case of sexual abuse for the audience, it's not so clear in the eyes of Annie herself, who desired a romantic relationship and was unwittingly manipulated by an older man. The play importantly cast light on those early, yet to be processed days in which we were still getting to know the internet and how many men and women had their first romantic and sexual experiences online. Slightly younger than Hirsch, the artist Bunny Rogers came of age in a time when both television and the web capitalized on programs and websites for kids. She was notably very into television. Like many digital made natives, hers is an identity formed amid the blooming mass media of the early 2000s. It could be argued that those who grew up since this era have experienced identification processes via both the television and computer screens, which introduce increasingly more remote content with which a child may uncannily identify with. Take, for example, a cartoon version of Joan of Arc. Rogers has illustrated this ph phenomenon of elastic identity via her various self-portraits as inanimate and often lugubrious objects. A mop dyed purple and a festooned with ribbon, and this is titled Self-Portrait Morning Mop, and is from 2013, or a handmade ceramic urn with the image of a cat on its front, which is titled Self-Portrait Cat Urn, also from 2013. Similarly, her works prove that she has a penchant for all things goth, both the mass-produced hot topic variety and the seriously antisocial variety. For a recent body of work titled Columbine Library, shown at Societe in Berlin in the summer of 2014, Rogers took inspiration from the 1999 Columbine High School Massacre, using two mainstream goth characters as stand-ins for the shooter's identities. Joan of Arc of Clone High representing Dylan Claybald and Gaz of Invader Zim representing Eric Harris. That Rogers assigns these twee goth cartoon characters as avatars for the seriously deranged shooters is another exercise in such elasticity of identification. This one specifically speaking to a personally felt sense of social alienation that vacillates between the pop and the psychotic. Rogers is not alone in identifying with Claybald and Harris, as we see countless online communities dedicated to them and other unlikely heroes. One may wonder how it is possible to both forget the cruelty of the shooters and to depersonalize the victims of the Columbine massacre to such an extent that entire communities valorize its perpetrators. To better understand the collective identification with the shooters, let's consider Laura Mulvey's take on active scopophilia in cinema within her landmark 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, and recontextualize it for the web. She writes, the mass of mainstream film portrays a hermetically sealed world which un unwinds magically, producing for the audience a sense of separation and a playing on their voyeuristic fantasy. Moreover, the extreme contrast between the darkness in the auditorium, which also isolates the spectators from one another, and the brilliance of the shifting patterns of light and shade on the screen helps to promote the illusion of voyeuristic separation. These conditions giving the spectator an illusion of looking in on a private world. And when I first read that, I was like, <laughs> 4chan, oh my god. Um, think about the subject of this passage not in a theater, but sitting at their private desk, staring into the alternate world of Facebook, a chat room, Tumblr, or a role-playing game. Mulvey says, scopophilic pleasurable structures must be attached to an idealization and presume aims and indifference to perceptual reality. 
creating the imagized, eroticized concept of the world that forms the perception of the subject and makes a mockery of empirical objectivity. That is to say, the physical separation of the body from the screen begets a psychological separation between the ego and the screen subject, allowing the ego's ideal version of the world to manifest, leading to this break with reality. Yet, given the somewhat active rather than passive nature of online participation, this world can be further reaffirmed and constructed via involvement in online echo chambers such as Google indexed online communities, such as men's rights forums, um, which you'll probably remember that um, the mass shooter Elliot Roger frequented, um, and role playing games, or even Facebook. Take into consideration the algorithmic edge rig system that Facebook employs in determining which posts show up in a user's feed. Here's the basic version. The more frequently user A clicks on or comments user B's posts, the more user A will see posted information by user B. Further, should user A have an abundance of friends all creating edges with user C, the more user A and associated users will see user C's posts. Thus, through click track, click tracking, Facebook effectively creates an ecosystem tailored to whatever and whoever incites, incites f users' feelings most ardently, including and not including peripheral voices based on their proclivity to manipulate the system. One only need to look to the world of Warcraft to witness an idealized world created via the egos of its players. World of Warcraft is an extremely successful, massively multiplayer online role-playing game, or MPORG, that celebrated its 10th birthday on, in November 2014. According to Wikipedia, World of Warcraft has grossed over $10 billion as of July 2012, with over 100 million accounts registered over its lifetime. Its users who, play, who pay a monthly subscription fee to play are also predominantly male. Our artist Angela Washko, who has been playing World of Warcraft since 2006, quickly noticed rampant misogyny, heightened male gendered language, and a lack of female players. Males oftentimes even play female characters. In early 2012, Washko founded the Council on Gender Sensitivity and Behavioral Awareness in World of Warcraft as an intervention within the game. As part of this in intervention, Washko ap approaches various characters and asks via the game's chat function what he or she thinks of the term feminism, which she then screen records or captures and uploads to her Tumblr. She also asked the players about their professional and economic backgrounds, which are surprisingly disparate. The artist has spoken to the unemployed, pregnant teens, doctors, lawyers, paraplegics, angsty kids, and so on. And, and as most participants are early, earnestly interested, Washka's project survive, surveys a likely more diverse pool than, say, an art world panel on feminism. No shade to you guys. Um, she, of course, gets a quite a few off-color comments. Upon asking a male person why he was playing a female character, he said, well, I'd rather stare at a girl's ass all day than a guy's, as if it were inherently homosexual to play a male character. Again, channeling Mulvey, Washko noted to me in a recent conversation that this is a classic fantasy of the ideal ideal female projected onto the female on screen. When asked why this misogynistic behavior is so rampant online, Washka replied that she thought that because there's no body to body public accountability in online space, such communities act as a moral free safe zone through which we can act out our most base desires with no consequences. In other words, it's a playground for scopophilia. So this is where the talk gets to be something else. Um, so this is research that I've been doing with a colleague of mine 
named B. Taylor, and I've been um, interviewing people, but it hasn't really found a home yet as writing or an exhibition. <coughs> now that I've spoken about the sexual othering of the female subject, I'd like to pose a series of questions about the forever fraught topic of female self-portraiture. Please keep in mind that this is a somewhat difficult triggering subject. I'll be showing slides including nudity, and much of the term terminology I'm about to use here is deeply problematic. And the effects I'm speaking about are really difficult to point to and quantify, but they're also collectively and keenly felt. I'm also hoping for feedback on this. So let's start with some quotes. And this is actually taken from a Facebook conversation I recently had with um, the artist and writer Mira Shore, whose um, Facebook is kind of a um, hub for a lot of discussion. Unfortunately, in a patriarchal society where women are from childhood focused on their body rather than the world, it is all too tempting and it makes total sense to use one's body and one's art. It is all anyone is really interested, interested in about you. The brain of the woman artist is generally not respected except within the most refined cadres of academia. Your body is often your principal asset and your biggest problem, physically or psychically. Yeah, physically and psychologically. It's your subject matter and material. I'm not saying this from an essentialist point of view, but a realist point of view, and let's face it, you get a lot of attention for it, whether via controversy or not, and it doesn't matter, in fact, au contraire, <laughs> controversy is good. This kind of sum sums up the problem that I'm referring to. When we introduce sexuality to art, it becomes a criteria for, ju for judgment, furthering the marginalization of female artists to speak about female rather than universal issues. Sexuality that is problematic is sexuality that is constructed for the male gaze and meant to profit off of it. Now to stumble through some questions. Is the representation of the female body in art always subject to objectification? Can a female body ever truly subvert the male gaze? If we look back to the second wave, um, if we look back to second wave feminist art, we'll see that the overwhelming majority of canonized female artists are white, cisgendered, conventionally attractive, and they use their nude body in their work. This is Hannah Wilkie. Um, Hannah Wilkie, for example, was largely derided by the feminist community for using her conventionally attractive female body, and she wasn't validated by her critics until she was dying from cancer and continued to photograph her ravaged body. She died in 1993. Fast forward to today, and we have social media networks that amplify both performative narcissism and scopophilia, which we talked about before. What should we make of the overwhelming popularity of the voluntary self-sexualization of the female artist amplified by so social media? I'm thinking about artists such as Bunny Rogers, who I spoke about before, and even Amalia Ullman, who is speaking after me. Further, what are the implications of using social media as an artistic medium? How does this confuse the reception of these practices as art? How are these issues complicated and expanded by the, necess the necessity of the artist's use of social media? In the, in, in the event of an artist blowing up, so to speak, should the artist be held responsible for accepting such attention, or should they push back? These artists can't help their attractiveness. Should they be expected to not capitalize upon bodily characteristics that are valued by a patriarchal society? Can voluntary self-sexualization even be considered an actual category, given that absolutely anything can be sexualized? Remember 4chan's edict that no matter what it is, it's somebody's fetish. No exceptions. In light of this, can we ascribe a set of ethics dealing with artwork that sexualizes the female body? How can we, evolve, how can we avoid calling out artists for bad feminism while fostering a community discussion about self-representation. 
Thanks.